This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 191, recorded on December 20th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. Welcome back. Thank you. It's nice to get over a cold. You sound a little coldish, yeah. I'm still a little bit, but... Uh, I caught one in Zurich. Did you? Yep. Let me get out my violin. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Zurich, that's wonderful. We're not complaining. That's, that's a nice problem to have, yeah. That voice you hear is none other than Michelle Swanson. Welcome. Hello, and I'm sorry you caught a cold, Vincent. Oh, but come on. Now. It's not as bad. Thing. Historic. It's just that you can pinpoint the hour that you start to get the symptoms. Mm. You get your th throat is a little scratchy. Yeah, it was great to be in Zurich. I wasn't far from you. I was I that was then in Madison, Wisconsin. Wow. And then uh, this week I was in Massachusetts. Awesome. They call me the peripatetic virologist. <laughs> peripatetic I'm sure virologist. you've been called first. Also joining us from South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Are you peripatetic? You are. You were just in Washington, right? I was just in Washington with Michelle. Michelle was there, too. Michelle was yeah. there, too. Doing our national service, international service for the American Society for Microbiology. I hardly go there anymore. I used to go a lot, and um, they decided they didn't need us. <laughs> well, I think the, the take-home message from <laughs> the meeting on Monday was that they do need us. And I thought it was a very good discussion talking about molecular biology and physiology. Mm -hmm. And we were specifically talking about the things we need to do as the Council of Microbial Sciences begins to scope where that those two particular disciplines uh, should go with the assistance from ASM. Mm. Speaking, of, speaking of ASM, if you go to ASM.org, you can see their brand new website. Oh, really? It's very nice. It's all redone. Yep. Beautiful, beautiful. And also speaking of ASM, in an effort to make ASM's podcasts the best they can be, This Week in Microbiology wants to learn more about you, the listeners of TWIM. Please take five minutes to answer this short 12-question survey. Surveys help us collect the data we need to seek sponsorship, which would allow us to grow the podcast. Surveys at asm.org slash twimpoll. That's asm.org slash T-W-I-M-P-O-L-L. -L. Thanks for your time and listening, subscribing, and helping us improve the show. We appreciate the support. And in the spirit of the season, that could be your gift to the Twim podcasters. Five minutes ah, to fill out the survey. Minutes. Thank you very much. Now we know, No card needed. <laughs> we know that some of you are driving, and by the time you get to where you're going, you forget. And some of you are pipetting, and by the time you're done, you forget and all that. So we understand why you can't do it. So we're going to bother you for the next hundred ep. No, just kidding. <laughs> hundred? <laughs> no, that's, that would be we'll years. Be old then. That would be two years. No, if you can, we have uh, less than a hundred people so far, and we know there are thousands of you out there. So help us out. We'd like to know all about you. It's only only a few questions, twelve questions, and you can answer them all, um, and uh, they're easy. You don't even have to click all the um, crossing. Like what do you think of our sense of humor? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or the weather and report. We, we promise we won't sell your data. We don't sell your data. We're not well, evil. Facebook may invade. You never can tell. Is, did I say this is the last twim for 2018? Not yet. It is. Not yet. It is. This is December 20th. So and the next time you hear us, it'll be a new year and, a, and an odd year, 2019. I don't know. And you'll be a year older because your birthday is going to be passed. That's right. The January 2nd is my birthday. All right. Does anyone else on this show have a birthday in January? Not me. Mine's in May. Alio's in June, right? April. April. Michelle. And I'm the, day, I'm the day after Groundhog Day. Which is, uh, Mar this is March? February. No, February. 3rd. February 3rd. Okay. Yeah, the twin crew gets a year older every year. How about that? 
<laughs> so does the planet. <laughs> Michael, you have a snippet for us. Tell us. About I do. It. And it, our, our story begins between five and 6,000 years ago. So talk about getting older. A time when many Neolithic societies were on the decline throughout Western Eurasia. And for those of you geographically challenged, that is the combined <laughs> landmass of the continents of Europe and Asia. And uh, in this paper, the emergence and spread of basal lineages of Yersinia pestis during the Neolithic decline by Roscoven, Shogren, Christensen, Nielsen, Willerslev, Deneuze, and Rasmussen that will appear early next year in the first probably issue of that year's cell will learn of the discovery and genome reconstitution of Yersinia pestis, the etiological agent of ancient plague, and Neolithic farmers from Sweden that predates and is basal to all modern and ancient known strains of this devastating microbe. How these authors make such a claim, a claim that effectively rewrites our understanding of the historical context of how the plague bacillus has influenced civilization is the topic of their paper. And I thought it would be a, an interesting snippet for us to consider because some of us will probably get uh, one of those DNA kits this year, either from 23andMe or Ancestry.com. So I thought instead of looking at where our ancestors come from, we'd look at how plague moved across uh, the earth. And this is one of the earliest instances of how plague moved. And there's principally four points. Uh, to this paper. It starts with the discovery of plague infecting these Neolithic farmers in Scandinavia of all places, which not only predates all the known cases of plague that we knew about, but they also will show us beautiful data that this particular strain is older than all the known modern and ancient strains that were in uh, the DNA database. And this is headline news by itself, for it takes away the stigma that plague was generally attributed to the Middle Kingdom or China. Their genetic analysis will take us on this incredible journey where they identify a remarkable overlap between the estimated radiation times of how plague moved through these ancient societies uh, towards Europe and the Eurasian steppe which is coincidence with the collapse of the Tripilia mega settlements in the Balkans and Eastern Europe. And the third point they bring up is the results are consistent with the existence of a prehistoric plague pandemic that spread mainly through early trade networks rather than what was formally thought, these massive human migrations and it's because of the early trade networks that then allowed this rapid and large scale expansion of the pathogen that then persisted through the Bronze Age uh, with lineages that eventually went distinct. And then, of course, the lineages that were responsible for the medieval plagues, you know, in the years 1400, when we saw the Dark Ages uh, descend uh, across Europe. And finally, they propose that the plague may have contributed to the Neolithic decline, which then paved the way for the late, later uh, uh, migrations into Europe from this Eurasian uh, steppe region. I could stop here, but I'd like to share with you some of their insight and introduce you to some of how they accomplished this remarkable story, because I think those of us who have ever played with 23 and me and gotten our ancestry genomes back and saw how our ancestors walked across the globe. I think this paper will help you appreciate the amount and type of work that goes into that sort of analysis. So how they it, did it. It really is a wonderful weaving of evolution of a microbe and world history. It's it's really a remarkable paper. It's a it's a fun snippet to read because 
if you know enough about the biology of sequencing, it's a little bit off topic for microbiology, other than it's talking about the uh, emergence of this old plague strain, but it, it really helps you to become conversational with some of the genetic phraseology. And so they first combined phylogenetic and molecular clock analysis of the bacterial genome with detailed archeological information and genomic analyses collected from infected individuals and hundreds of ancient human samples across Eurasia. And where did they get the DNA? Well, they went to cemeteries and burial was even as common way back, you know, 6,000 years ago. So they went to these old cemeteries where they could isolate bones and they actually recovered the pathogens from teeth of, of the individuals. And we also know the microbiome. You mean they recovered live Yersinia? Uh, no, they recovered nucleic acid. They didn't recover yeah. Yersinia. This is all nucleic acid. No bacteria were no bacteria were harmed in the conduct of this study. <laughs> and Michael, did they use teeth because they did? They, the people weren't flossing, and they had to uh, probably biofilms so. between their teeth, I, and that, that's where I, there was. I, a, and I think that's where the nucleic acid dried down because so they, they were they they take it from the pulp, which is inside, and it's mm -hmm. completely protected, right? Yes. And so it turns out that you know there is circulation in there. The bacteria get to the pulp, and you can drill through the the outside of the tooth and get some of the pulp out and get DNA from it. It's really a remarkable finding. Wow. It's, it's a remarkable technology. And we also know, and here's where the micro comes in, that for infections to be successful, the microbe needs a host. And the spread of farming practices across Western Eurasia was followed by this demographic expansion with technological innovation. So we're talking about the time that humans discovered pottery, animal traction, the wheel, and of course, metals. The transition from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age is where we began to incorporate metals into our tools, which generally signifies the transition from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age. And so, um, which each of these events, we saw the initiation of trading networks, which for the first time could reach remote geographic regions. Because if you think about it, Sweden is, is geographically isolated from, if you will, the fertile crescent where we think most humans emerge from. At the same time, we also see these first mega settlements in the territories of what is today modern Moldova, Romania, and the Ukraine. And it was, again, settled by this population known as the Tripolia culture, which was living between 6,800 and 5,000 years ago. And we find our first megacity. And a megacity doesn't have the same definition then as it does now. Then a megacity was 10,000 to 20,000 people. Today in America, that's a small town, uh, which is very different from the megacities of today, such as Shanghai, which has 24 million. And the largest megacity in North America is, of course, Mexico City at 8.9 million, with uh, New York coming in a close second at 8.5. And they reported that these mega settlements were typically short lived, they were regularly abandoned, they were burned. And then they typically were reconstructed at about a about 150-year cycle. My guess is that's how long it took for the trees to come back so they could have enough fuel to effectively live in, in these localities. But then about 5,400 years ago, these mega settlements were no longer being rebuilt. And so here's where the story begins or their hunt. And the historians maintain that the Neolithic decline of these mega settlements was a consequence of environmental overexploitation with a decrease or even the extinction of the forests and the expansion of this steppe environment or these mega grasslands and or confrontation 
with foraging population that were still hunter gatherers trying to come in and disrupt things going on. But here's where the authors take us down their rabbit hole, where they propose that it may have been the emergence of an infectious disease secondary to the close contact between humans and the ability of uh, humans to exploit animals to do uh, plowing and moving materials, as well as the accumulation of food, which of course brings uh, rodents and other uh, pests to the mix, as well as poor sanitary condition, at, which then ultimately results in the death of these mega cities. And so they take us to these Neolithic farmers in Scandinavia that lived in these small, probably family oriented uh, farmsteads. And they discovered this grave site. And that's where they got the ancient DNA from. And they figured out when they assembled it, it was indeed an ancient strain of Yersinia pestis. And this was, you know, a surprise to them because up until that point in time, many thought plague had arrived from China and their analysis, their genetic analysis revealed that this was the earliest strain that anyone had seen up to that point in time. And it was older than the most ancient strain of pestis infections that were reported from ancient human populations from the Eurasian steppe, where they thought that the um, plague bacillus had migrated from uh, China via the uh, temperate grassland that stretches from Manchuria all the way back to uh, Romania. So as they, so that headline news, number one, they had this ancient plague bacillus that they referred to as the Gokek 2 strain, and it predates all known variants of pestis. And they take us through the phylogeny and the phylogenetic reconstruction of this genome very elegantly comparing it to uh, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis and then 183 different strains of pestis. And their analysis was quite remarkable, showing that even in spite of the relatively low depth of the genome, they didn't have lots of different isolates. And because of, you know, just damage to the nucleic acid that they uh, recovered out of the pulp of the teeth, uh, secondary to transition uh, mutations, they re reconstructed the phy phylogeny, excluding transition mutations, and found that this GOKEK2 strain was clearly earlier than any of the other Bronze Age clades that were in the extant database. And they did this by a technique that we have not yet discussed at any great length on TWIM, but is common to molecular genetics, and it's one of the hallmarks that these genetic analyses companies use, and that's namely single nucleotide variants, or SNV analysis. And again, the single nucleotide variation technique that they used was key because here, even due to the post-mortem degradation of the DNA, they made a call where they only looked at the sequences in the middle where you wouldn't be susceptible to nibbling by nucleases or any of that uh, associated degradation. And it was still ancient. But one of the interesting things of the four variants that were located within the genes uh, with functions related to host pathogen interactions, they found the need for siderophores. And we know that Yersinia pestis needs iron, and it's one of its hallmark characteristics of how it gets iron actually influences its pathogenesis, as well as there were mutations in uh, ton as well as toll. And ton, of course, is involved in energy utilization to transport stuff into the cell. And toll, of course, is involved in transport as well. And again, they also found issues with motility and chemotaxis. So it's just absolutely fascinating. They explain some of the microbiology of it. And then 
they take us on our trip. And now we talk about the large scale radiation of Yersinia pestis during the Neolithic decline. And here's how they walk us across Europe. And this is where their figures are really impressive. They're very colorful. They show how things different, and they do this with molecular clock analysis to estimate the divergence times between lineages. And recall that a molecular clock is nothing more than a figurative term that uses the mutation rate. So they're looking for changes in sequence, and then they deduce the time in prehistory when one or two of the life forms may have diverged. And this biomolecular data used for these calculations was state of the art and they described their method. And I'm not going to go into the detail of that because this is, is only a snippet. And so as we look at their data that they present, they take us on this travel log and these are principally summarized for us in beautiful detail in the fourth and fifth figures of the paper, which is a effectively a map. They use a skull and crossbones in their figures to denote where they isolated DNA from skulls and to effectively confirm what was going on. And it sort of upends what everyone else had been suspecting that plague came out of China. And it didn't indeed. It was literally out of this steppe region as to where this material likely then came from and radiated. Now, the final piece of their headline news is that the Bronze Age and the Gok II lineages did not initially spread with massive human migration. And these data come from this admixture analysis which, if you will, is the 23andMe story that we've all seen if you've ever looked at your ancestral maps. And admixture mapping is not a technique that I was familiar with until I began to investigate my genetic lineage from 23andMe or Ancestry and, and saw how the admixed population was able to find genetic loci. And this is a relatively new technique and it's all, you know, it's effectively from the sequencing revolution of the 2000s that we're able to make inferences of, of humans and the, the outbreeding of what's been going on and how chromosomal segments were inherited from one another or another ancestral population. But, and, but Michael, in, in general, um, the two models are it was either migration of people that brought the disease or trade. And Correct. I think what you're saying is by looking at, let's say, region one versus region two, if the people there are genetically very different, but they harbor bacterial strains that are genetically very similar, then you have to entertain the trade model. Correct. Right. And rather than with, people moving and resettling. Correct. Because the interbreeding would have blended that that's effectively the basis for their argument that it was indeed mm -hmm. trade. And I was just coming to that as, as I was transitioning out of the admixture. So what Michelle just told us is exactly, they provide data that show clearly that it was trade rather than these massive migrations due to a mega city or a war or something causing the mega city to decamp and move on that was uh, responsible uh, for the moving of the plague. And that's how they come to the fifth figure. So here they do a combined estimate of the divergent time, looking at the phylo phylogenetic relationships of the pesta strains. And if you're keeping track, they harvest data from their earlier figures, and then they present it with the genetic data from the the genetic data from the people, which is the fourth figure, and then the migratory elements and the archaeological histories from human populations in Eurasia to build their all-encompassing model 
of dispersion of plague during the Neolithic and Bronze Ages. And the chronology and pieces of information by each of the respective layers that they fold onto this model support the existence of an emergence of a focus of pestis in mega settlements of Eastern Europe. And the plague radiation begins with the collapse of these societies. And they argue that the triplaculture between 6,100 and 5,400 years ago are these good candidates simply because they had the largest known Neolithic sediments in Europe with a chronology that fits the estimated divergence time of the Yersinia that they recovered from, from Scandinavia. And by the time of the initial radiation of the Kokum strains, the triplet populations were, un, were likely under nutritional stress and were severely weakened due to environmental over-exploitation. And so the stressed populations living under highly dense conglomerations are precisely the conditions that then would favor these plague epidemics and pandemics, which then lead the authors to propose that the triple mega settlements as the best candidate for the emergence of these ancestors that are responsible for the basal lineage of plague that they saw in uh, Scandinavia. And it was only because they looked in Scandinavia, they got lucky and found one of these old uh, lineages. So that's effectively the story, unless Michelle, want, you want to add something well, else? So the, um, the emergence of pathogenic pestis, they um, can deduce, accelerated the um, collapse of those Neolithic uh, societies, yes. Societies, right? Well, that's a guess. Yeah, I think that's a guess, right? You can never really... You right. never really know unless you have a time machine. Michael, couldn't there, couldn't there even be an earlier emergence that we don't have samples for before this tri tri just tripilia, sure. right? Yeah, and if we have to go and find the skulls and see if we can pull it out of the yeah. pulp yeah. of those individuals. Yeah. But what I found remarkable is that from what I understand of pestis, it kills you pretty quickly. And I was impressed that the microbe was actually may be able to get into the pulp of teeth as quickly as that infection kills individuals. Yeah. And they argue that's part of the evidence that um, this could have been a very pathogenic strain. Right. Yes. If, if it was in the teeth, it must have gotten because of high numbers. invasive yeah. disease. Yeah. So high blood stream numbers to get into the teeth. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it's, it's a fascinating story. And Elio pointed out to me that there's another paper in PNAS that talks about medieval plague from the 1400s. Mm -hmm. So this one was a little earlier. The techniques are pretty similar in that particular paper. And I'll put a reference to medieval plague if you're interested in that into the show notes. Mm. Well, nice story. It's a good nice. story. We, we should keep looking for teeth. That's the bottom line. <laughs> well, well old, I mean. Older and older teeth. Well, it, it only tells you if you have an infection that gets to very, very high numbers in the bloodstream yeah. because it has to be transported by the bloodstream. Yeah. You're not necessarily mm. going to find staph unless it sure, happens sure. to go on septic on you. I see. So, Michael, they have the whole genome sequence here. Can they tell if there's. Are there extra genes? Are there anything missing? Uh, there's nothing missing that I recall from, from yeah. reading it, but um, I didn't go and s compare and contrast to all of the others. I think they were just looking at it from a phylogenetic and molecular sure. yeah. clock perspective. Yep. And I believe they did find one of the hallmark virulence factors, plasminogen activator. Mm -hmm. They found that yes. gene. Right, mm. right. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. That, that story history. That, that story has some teeth, doesn't it? Oh, <laughs> groan, groan. oh everybody uh, groans. Oh, my gosh. Getting yes. a little punchy at the end of the term. Huh. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, Elio, what do you have for us? Well, I also have a story that has a historical meaning. It's a paper. I'll read you the title. It's Engineering Yeast Endosymbionts 
is a step towards the evolution of mitochondria. And let me tell you who the authors are. They are Meta, Supekova, Chen, Peston, Jamasp, Webster, Cole, Henderson, McDermott, Supek, and Schultz. Most, most of these people are in my backyard here in San Diego. A few are else, elsewhere in California. It's, this is a rather remarkable paper that has called a lot of attention because they are trying to reconstruct the events that led to the formation of eukaryotic cells. As we know, this is due to the endosymbiosis, the acquisition of an endosymbiotic bacterium by a protocell that was probably an archaeon. So this is a big deal. And um, as in the previous paper, the best way of finding out how it worked would be to have a time machine and to take, go back about 1.5 billion years. But the technique so far has been elusive, hasn't it, Michael? <laughs> yes. So. We, we haven't. Stephen Hawking that didn't leave us the secret. That's right. Anyhow, the, um, the best thing you can do is instead of going back and looking how it actually happened, is to try to reconstruct it. So the story is rather, it's really, um, it has a lot of beautiful wrinkles to it. So they started out uh, with a, a yeast and a bacterium, E. coli, and in both cases, they may have to make it dependent on the other because otherwise you're not going to have a stable endosymbiosis. So they started out with the yeast which are defective in the mitochondria. Uh, this is not so unusual. Uh, actually, Michael probably remembers when there were things called petite mutants. which was I so remember yes. too. Remember that too? Good. <laughs> He's that being polite too. to you, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> so petite mutants were mutants which essentially had no functional mitochondria and they made small colonies. They could not grow on non-fermentable carbon sources like glycerol. So uh, you can easily pick them up because they won't grow on glycerol and uh, they require, therefore, something in order to survive. A different carbon source will do, but an endosymbiont will do even better. So that's the defective yeast. The tit for tat is that they made E. coli defective. And by the way, I'm sorry if I sound hoarse, but I'm getting over one of those maybe RNA virus, maybe DNA virus of the common <laughs> cold. Sorry about that. Anyhow, the bacterium was E. coli, and they made that deficient in thiamine, vitamin B1, which is required for growth of E. coli, and it's an essential component. And now, but it's made by yeast, and so the bacteria provide the mitochondrial function that is oxidative metabolism, and in a sense, ATP. And they can eat they can. the glycerol. That's right, that's right. And the um, yeast provides the E. coli with thiamine. So they did a lot of engineering because this sounds simple, but it ain't. The reason, there's several reasons for this. First of all, let's go through the steps. <clears throat> you have a yeast cell and you have a bacterium cell. How do you get it one to get into the other? Well, there is a technique that's been developed a long time ago, which is called spheroplast fusion. You make spheroplasts that is cell wall less cells of yeast, which is not hard to do, they grow fine. That is, well, they grow somewhat as uh, cell wallless entities. <clears throat> and in the presence of polyethylene glycol, this is easy to fuse cells together. So if you take yeast, spheroplast, they eagerly accept E. coli, and uh, they are now ensconced in the cytoplasm of the yeast, and supposedly, tit for tat takes place. The yeast feeds the E. coli. The E. coli feeds the yeast. Well, and they call these they call these cybrids. Cybrids, hybrid, yeah. Hybrid cytoplasm. Right. I like that. Yeah, not bad. Uh, turns out that when they did this, it didn't quite work. And the reason it didn't quite work is not surprising. Bacteria that. Uh, live inside of eukaryotic cells, like uh, what, like Rickettsia, like Legionella, like many others. Uh, Michel can wax very eloquent. <laughs> this. Uh, 
uh, they they have a way of getting out from the lysosomal degradative machinery, which is possessed generally by eukaryotic cells. In other words, eukaryotic cells have a way of of uh, breaking up, of lysing bacteria, and only a few have mechanisms to survive that. And one of the mechanisms has to do with proteins that are uh, inhibitory of the so-called snare, S-N-A-R-E, proteins, which are what rearranges the lysosomal machinery and allows cells to break up the bacteria. So bacteria have, some bacteria have, like chlamydia, like rickettsia, I think rickettsia, have essentially anti-snare, snare-like proteins, which inhibit the snare activity and allow it to survive inside of cells. Okay. So they took the snare-inhibiting proteins from chlamydia and cloned them into the E. coli. And after a few more manipulations having to do with the fact that nothing is perfect in biology, and this took <laughs> a lot of doing, they finally obtained yeast colonies which harbored intracellular E. coli. One of the ways they could tell is that they had labeled the E. coli with green fluorescent protein, or fluorescent proteins, and so they could see it under the fluorescent microscope. And uh, they could also use a technique that I was not acquainted with, which is called soft X-ray tomography, which they say is a technique that is especially suited for imaging intact cells at high resolution. Any of you heard of this? No, I had not. Never. Soft X-ray tomography. <laughs> and they show how you can see, you can do tomography, that is, you can have look at optical slices, virtual slices, and you can see the E. coli very nicely inside of the yeast cell. So you can see that the E. coli is in the yeast cell. Uh, and uh, so there you have it. You have engineered it in such a way, as I say, I won't go into all the details because they're considerable. There's a lot of work involved here. But eventually they got E. coli to be happy inside of a yeast cell and a yeast cell happy to have the E. coli in it. And this goes on for many generations and it can be studied. And if I could just add, Elio, this is one thing I appreciated about the paper because they walked us through not only what worked, but also what they tried and it didn't work. That's right. So we kind of saw how the sausage was made. So it gives, gives you a really good feel for what experimental research is like. We call it research and not search for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I hadn't heard uh, that. <laughs> Anyhow, the, uh, but you're right. It's quite a paper and it's well, it's well worth reading and going over it. So anyhow, at that point, uh, they they can as well they can say this is maybe a step towards the evolution of mitochondria. That uh, it says that in the title, but it's really op it's an open question. I mean, how relevant is this to what actually happened? And there are many questions to be asked. So one of the questions is: uh, mitochondria have very few genes, twenty kilobase worth of DNA. It's not much. However, many of the genes which were probably in the original proto-symbiont, made it to the nucleus. So what happens to E. coli? Can you make E. coli lose some of its genes and still function as a mitochondrion? So they made a very early stab at this. Namely, they um, uh, made some mutants that require, require uh, they do, do not have certain genes and the E. coli seems to be okay. But it's a very early step. In reality, the E. coli still is a long way from being downsized to mitochondria. It's, it's quite a ways. Uh, and so it's, it's a nice step. It's a very clever experiment. I have one sort of alternative idea which came up from reading this paper, and that is, what if instead of using E. coli, which you have to you have to engineer to do all kinds of things to do to be useful here, it's easy to do in E. coli, but still, it's why not use something which naturally gets into cells like rickettsia? The reason for using rickettsia is that rickettsia are in fact probably as close as it gets to the earliest cell that became a mitochondrion. The DNA of mitochondria is as close as, as anything to 
alpha proteobacteria of which the rickettsia belong. Rickettsia, I remind you, are strict intracellular parasites they cause typhus and other diseases, and um, they are very good at getting into cells. They're terrific. They even get into the nucleus of cells, some of them. So if you started with them, you would you would have it's a, an organism that's adapted to do it, that's evolved to do it, instead of having to teach E. coli to do it. Now, of course, you'd have to downsize it in the sense that the rickettsia now, when they infect a cell, thrive and multiply and kill the cell. You don't want that. So you'd have to make a mutant of rickettsia that doesn't do that, that simply survives inside those cells. But it occurred to me that this one may have been in on the, uh, somewhat easier. On the other hand, nothing is easier than to work with E. coli, and working with rickettsia is not the same thing. Mm. Well, think Anyhow. about this as think about this as well. If you're thinking about gene therapy, wouldn't you like to be able to engineer the rickettsia, uh, which easily gets into cells, to bring in a transacting protein that a eukaryotic cell might need? that we have a genetic lesion for that we're unable to manufacture and you effectively deliver it. And if you could chronically infect it, like to, to effectively make it a symbiote so that it remains in the system, it, it may be a less harsh way to do gene therapy. Would, Would you sign up for that trial, Michael? (laughs) I'm no. Sure. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm trying to understand, you know, the motivation behind, besides trying to understand um, the motivation behind uh, understanding symbiosis of uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but to understand if there is a translational aspect that they may be able to think about mm. uh, doing this sort of things. I mean, I agree yeah, with you. Synthetic that the, biology. Synthetic biology, it, and I guess mm-hmm. it's part of Monday. It's a holdover from Monday where we were talking about synthetic biology. Yeah. So Peter Schultz, the senior author, who's also president of the Scripps Research Institute, was interviewed by Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News when this paper came out. And he um, is quoted as saying they're now already well on their way to deleting all the genes for making all 20 amino acids, which is a significant part of the E. coli genome. And then they'll start deleting genes for the synthesis of cofactors, nucleotides, etc. So their goal is to um, take what we already know about E. coli and go in and remove whole pathways and then identify what is the minimal endosymbiotic genome. So they're not going to let nature um, evolve an endosymbiote. They want to um, engineer the process. So that's probably why they started with E. coli, which can, you can manipulate so much more easily. And we know so much more about the pathways and the genes. Uh, Elio, can I ask you, do they have any direct evidence that energy produced by E. coli is being used yes. by the yeast? Yes. Yes, they do. They, they show the transfer. Well, they show the transfer that E. coli has been taught to transfer ATP, mm-hmm. which is an essential step. And actually, wait a minute. No, the, I, I take it back. They don't show directly that that ATP is taken up by yeast. It's made inside the yeast. So what else is going to happen to it? Mm. Well, I mean, the original symbiont presumably used the, the, the proton gradient on the outside of the bacterium and transform that to the proton gradient of the mitochondria, right? So, you know, if, if E. coli is making yeast, uh, sorry, is making ATP in its cytoplasm, it's not quite the same thing, right? That's right. Yeah, you're right. Sure. Because the mitochondria is backwards. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. And the other, the other issue, of course, is that the original endosymbiont enter the cell probably without a nucleus, if it's an archaea, right? Right. So here, the presence of the nucleus may be, well, it's different. So I don't know how that's going to affect the evolution of this thing. In fact, well, there, there was something like a nucleus in the sense that the archaeon that took, in, took on the endosymbiont had DNA in it, you know. So. Yeah, but there was no membrane because... There was no membrane. We actually think the nuclear membrane evolved because of all the the insertions of of bacterial DNA into the, mm-hmm. the nuclear genome and, and had to deal with that. So, sure, yeah. sure. 
Yeah. One of the nice points they make is that in evolution, this step of acquiring a mitochondrion was very important at the time when oxygen became common in the environment mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because the original cell probably could not cope in an oxygen environment, whereas right. the parasitized one could. Right. So that's a nice point. Uh, that's a good point is that the uh, actually the, the machinery for coping with oxygen is very old because it was also, it's a similar machinery that copes with uh, UV irradiation, right? And so it, it had, something had to be there in order to cope with sure. oxygen, right? Mm-hmm. And um, back to your question, um, Vincent, about the ATP, was it being released from the E. coli? They did do some experiments just on the E. coli cultures. They engineered them to have a transporter that would transport ATP out of the cell. Mm-hmm. So they... They did verify that, but they didn't then, once it was within the yeast, they didn't then uh, test that part of the model. Yeah, yeah. No, but, but you know, it becomes so, I'm not sure how necessary it is, because how would the yeast grow unless it could use that ATP? Right. So it's, uh, you know, it's likely yeah, that if you're going to make ATP inside of a yeast cell, it can make it. That's how it's going to grow. That's, you know, it's gonna, that's how it's going to live. Uh, who knows? Maybe something else was. Is, I mean, I think you should show it directly. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. One thing that struck me about this paper is that they um, learned that they had to endow the E. coli with the ability to avoid being degraded in lysosomes, mm. and of course, that's a major major <laughs> that's barrier. A story. That's right. A story that's, of a, that's a major barrier to infection, and so I was curious if they are um, concerned that um, this strain now, if if fed to, say, a white blood cell that naturally can take up microbes, um, now they've, in a, well, they've created a, a new microbe that can survive inside uh, cells. And uh, they don't know if, if this, they know that this um, engineered E. coli symbiont can survive and replicate inside yeast, but whether it could also grow inside macrophages mm-hmm. and then uh, become essentially a new infectious particle um, is something they don't know the answer to. But it's, it's something you have to think about so when you're um, you, you think this in is synthetic a biology. Of, this is a source of possible concern that you can, you may create a new pathogen. Is that what you're saying? Well, it be kind of effectively uh, becomes seminal. Yeah, it, and probably not in one step, but it could be the, the first, first key step. So I'm, I'm just curious about that um, hurdle. Mm. So um, I was able to uh, communicate with the first author on this paper, Anga Mete, and he's a postdoc in the Schultz lab. He got his um, bachelor's degree in Mumbai, India, studying uh, chemical technology intermediates, and then a PhD in chemistry at Texas A&M before starting at uh, the Scripps Institute. And his PhD is uh, focused on mechanistic and structural studies of various enzymes, including uh, thymine primidine synthase, which happens to be one of the um, oxytrophies uh-huh. they created in their uh-huh. <laughs> E. coli symbiont. So he's clearly um, tapping his expertise there. And then as a postdoc, he's doing all kinds of really cool uh, engineering studies. For example, he uh, contributed to a paper where they evolved an E. coli strain that replaces 75% of its thymidine with a, um, a uridine, modified uridine. Oh, yeah. And then also a, a different project was to create a bacterial genome mm. that has chimeric DNA and RNA genome. Mm. So they're, they're doing some really that's creative another, that's another great story. We, wild we, projects. Yeah. But on this particular project, he worked closely with Lubika Supakova, a staff scientist in the Schultz lab. And he remembers a especially um, exciting day when they were sitting at group meeting discussing the evolution of eukaryotic cells. When Pete Schultz, the head of the lab, said, I wonder what would happen if we fuse yeast to E. coli. <laughs> and that that was all on got needed to like get excited and he and a team um went on to design the very clever genetic strategies to create this um symbiont these mutually dependent um microbial cells he said one of the happiest days in this project was when they saw GFP expressing bacteria within the yeast cells after having grown them on selection media for several days. And he said, Lubike and I were so excited. We rushed into our mentor's office to show him the data. And that day, sharing that um, excitement with his mentor was, was an incredible 
incredible experience, especially because his mentor is also one of his scientific heroes. Um, I asked if he had any advice for other trainees and students, and he said that you should always work on a question that you find really exciting, because if the question is fascinating, it will continue to motivate you when the going gets tough. <laughs> so when you run into roadblocks, you know, if you're really excited and motivated, motivated, you can get through those um, tough periods. So outside the lab, Angad has several hobbies. He likes to play and follow tennis, soccer, table tennis. He loves playing with his son and also going on road trips and hikes. Nice. Nice person. I want to just add one more thing to this, that remember that this endosymbiosis only happened twice. You know, as far as we know, it never happened outside of the two instances, right? So it's tough. It's... <laughs> It's it's a very rare event, and uh, whatever it is they're trying to do is probably not going to be straightforward, and they may not get exactly what happened, right? Or they probably won't. So we're back to the time machine. Let's work on that. But um, <laughs> should, it's interesting for sure. I think it, it's very it's, cool. It's very cool that they um, really took advantage of the deep literature, yeah. um, understanding uh, pathogenesis, what does it take to block delivery to a lysosome, metabolic pathways that they could knock out. Really beautiful work. Right. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Elio. Mm -hmm. Let's read Thank a couple let's read a couple of email to end the year. First one is from Ezra. He writes or she writes, Dear Twim team, on episode one eighty three, a listener named Triette asked for an example of a microbial symbiont that dictates the relationship with its host. I thought I'd expand on the topic and provide an interesting example. As part of their publication, Kevin Foster et al. discussed different microbiome models. This is a nature paper, the evolution of the host microbiome as an ecosystem on a leash. One of these is the host control model in which a host tightly regulates microbial phenotypes. The bobtail squid highlighted by Triet falls into this category. The symbiont control model in which a microbe alters global phenotypes such as reproduction, survival, or behavior in order to increase its own fitness relates to Triette's question. In both models, low microbial diversity within the host is required, which is perhaps why it is hard to think of many examples. One example of symbiont control is the symbiont Wolbachia, which is found in many different insect species. By living intracellularly, it avoids competition from other microbes. In Drosophila simulans, Wolbachia strain WRI can increase host survival from viral infection. The same strain also manipulates host reproduction, causing embryos originating from an uninfected mother and an infected father to be non-viable. Since WRI is only maternally transmitted, it hereby increases its transmission. Thus, WRI can alter host survival and reproduction such that infected mothers have a higher fitness than non-infected ones, resulting in an increased fitness of the microbe. A fascinating example that fits the symbiont control model. Thank you for hosting such an interesting and thought-provoking show. Writing this email was a lot of fun. Cheers, Ezra Herman is a statistics master student at the University of Glasgow. And Ezra sends along four references to support this discussion, all of which you can find at uh, microbe.tv slash twim. Thank you, Ezra. That was beautifully put. Very nice. Hey, Michael, you want to take the next one? I will. Larry writes, Dr. Racaniello at Alia. I was having trouble visualizing the CRISPR and CAS activity in yours and Dr. Sternberg's excellent discussion from September. So I paused and looked on YouTube and found what seems to be a perfect five-minute video accompaniment for neophytes such as myself. He provides the link to this YouTube video, and the video is entitled, What is the PAM? A CRISPR whiteboard lesson. Thanks again for great shows from Larry in San Diego. I went out and looked at that YouTube video, and it is fantastic. Cool. It's done in the style of uh, the Khan Academy, mm -hmm. where you have a very eloquent narrator drawing on a whiteboard what's actually going on. So if you have to go out and give a chalk talk, this is the ideal way to well illustrate something as complicated as the CRISPR and CAS system. He takes us from the beginning with phage all the way out and explains how it can be used to do good things, 
that CRISPR is doing out in the world today. Nice. So thanks, Larry. Thanks. In five short minutes, he does all that. That's mm-hmm. great. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really elegant. Apparently, Michelle, that is the key to engaging. <laughs> short. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, can you take the Sarah's? Sure. Hi, Twim team. I've had a lot of conversations recently about failed experiments. In an epidemiology lecture, we discussed how journals have a bias toward publishing papers that reject the null hypothesis. In other words, papers that seemingly find something new. In relation to this, while discussing evidence-based intervention development, we lamented that because the failures of some interventions are never reported or published, those interventions continue being practiced and then continuing to fail. I'm sure this type of bias exists in many fields. I certainly remember times in the virology lab where students stressed over poster presentations because they could not prove their hypothesis with the evidence they had. However, finding out something that does not fulfill your expectations is just as valid as finding something that does. Edison found hundreds of ways not to make a light bulb after all. (laughs) I want to hear your opinions on this with respect to your academic experiences. How do you deal with interpreting research that doesn't seem to find anything new? Do you think there's a space for a journal of failed experiments if it doesn't already exist? Thank you, Sarah. Hi. Well, I've had some experience um, with this, and we had a paper years ago which you know, reported negative results, and the journal said we don't publish negative results. So it is an wow. issue. But however, in the meanwhile, PLOS One has emerged and you can publish your negative results there if you'd like. You know, the criteria there are just that the, the, the conclusions have to be supported by the experiments. And so I think that helps. But certainly the high profile journals will not publish unless you find something. Uh, what, what do you think, Michelle? Well, uh one uh, compromise is, as we saw in the paper today, they were taking us through how they engineered this E. coli endosymbiont, and they described two attempts, their first two attempts that did not work, and then the third one that did. Mm-hmm. So maybe we need to get a little better about maybe tucking into materials and methods or <laughs> supplemental figures. By the way, we tried this and that, and it didn't work. We had to do this yeah. to I mean, make it yeah, go. Those are important. So another possible offshoot. That sometimes when experiments don't work, they actually open the door to something else. Sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, you have to have very good ears and eyes and nose to know when it's worth giving up on what you've been doing and follow the new avenue that's open or say, well, that's not, that's not that important or something. Yeah. So you have to really be very astute about this. But you should never sort of uh, I, I think a tendency that we have uh, to reduce it to more simple cases, an experiment doesn't work. So, you know, do it over. Well, that's not the answer necessarily. Often what you want to do is to really look at it and find out the reason why it didn't work. And certainly if you do an experiment and you get the opposite result, so all your controls work, but you got the opposite result, oh, that's that can be exciting because it means exactly. there's something, some biology going on that you did not account for, and therefore there's an opportunity for discovery. So, yeah, so not everything has to be hypothesis driven. Mm-hmm. Michael, any thoughts? But I'm sorry, Michelle. I, I, I agree. It's, you know, the, you know, failed experiments often give you the best insight. But the most important thing is you have to have controls. And they definitely would save money for the research enterprise if people um, did well controlled experiments that didn't work and shared them with their colleagues. So other people didn't Mm. go down that same uh, dead end. That's certainly, that's certainly the case in immunology. I go to a lot of seminars using knockout animals and, and this particular knockout, it didn't behave. And then they go off hunting for other knockouts or another, other background animals. And you get completely different results depending upon the background. So I think, there is a, a purpose for that. And maybe that's what PLOS One's intention is. And then for, don't forget there's BioArchive where you could put oh, yeah. your manuscript, even if it's never accepted to a journal, it's there for people to find and say, oh, that approach didn't work. So 
you know, the, the thing is that an approach in one lab that doesn't work may work in another lab. So, you know, it's good to have it out there so people knows. No. Yeah, because it because the distilled water is different or exactly. something. Exactly. The face of the face of the moon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that too happens. Sarah, by the way, who asked this question, uh, does the transcripts for Twim? Ah. So thank you, Sarah. That is Twim one ninety one, the last for twenty eighteen, and hopefully we will have forty eight Twims in uh, twenty nineteen. You can find. Twim at asm.org slash twim. And if you listen on a phone or a tablet, you have an app that you use, please subscribe to us in the app. You will get every episode, which we release twice a month automatically. And you will help us because we will see how many people subscribe and we can use that to show how popular we are and improve the show. If you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute have a couple of ways that we can help you out. And of course, always send your questions and comments to twim at microbe.tv. Today on Twim, Michelle Swanson from the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. And uh, wishing you all a restful holiday. You bet. Elio Schechter's at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. And again, uh, Happy New Year to everybody. And a peaceful year it may be. Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, and I echo Elio's sentiments. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of Twin was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. <laughs>